Uh, very interesting, you know, I, uh, this place already makes me so much more calmer than, than I usually am. Uh, when uh, Dr. Shoba was talking about uh, the, the deer running, uh, my, my, I actually, my uh, thoughts went back to a very famous incident uh, a few thousand years ago. The same tiger, the same deer, but that deer was pregnant. And in the middle of the river, it gave birth. And then the tiger did pounce on it. But that little deer was saved by a king who had retired to the forest. And his name was Bharata. And from that actually became, started probably the greatest spiritual journey this country has ever known. Please read the story of Jada Bharata in the, in the Bhagavata Purana. And, and it all starts with things like these, isn't it? But today I'm going to talk, I mean, I'm, I'm very... Uh, Surprised when uh, Shoba reached out to me because I, I take care of a dance of another kind, a kind uh, that that teaches cells to communicate, that deals with what happens when we fail to communicate. I'm an endocrinologist by profession, but I'm also uh, I know what Indian or Bharatiya means, but I'm that at heart. It's it's part of every cell of mine and. And I've spent many, many years trying to unravel the mysteries that our ancestors knew and, and knew much better than many of us do. Uh, I'm going to sort of re-paraphrase Kalidasa. This Kalidasa said that what is, don't be enamored with just the old, examine the new. I'm going to say, don't be enamored with just the new, examine the old to see if that fits you. So let me talk to you about a very ancient story. If you want to think about the very origin of the cosmos, I want to think about the very origin of how, how life starts. You would think about, and if you, and if you want to interpolate it to our own literature, it is, it is the uh, Jatha, which is Shiva, and the oscillations that start getting created because of a single thought that becomes Shakti. For those of you who are Sri Vidya Upasakas, you know that, that this is the primordial Thing that, that, that dominates us. If you want to think about us as humans, as an evolution, think of us from a primordial soup where there was a single cell and there were many cells and then they decided to communicate by releasing small amount of proteins into that soup. And those proteins and, and secretions told other cells to organize. Then we became multi-celled organisms. We still are just a collection of the same cell that has decided to specialize itself to achieve a purpose. And, and you know, uh, it forms a harmony. For those of you who read the Brihadarnika Upanishad or the Purusha Suptam, which is a far more distal way of it, different parts of the same thing, growing and doing different things, right? Then we humans evolved. And as we evolved, we started doing things that are slightly different. And I can tell you that aside from the cockroach, we probably are the most resilient of species. The cockroach is still the most resilient. We are in good company, right? So why are we the most resilient species? Because we have evolved the ability to take over the planet. Whether we're going to destroy it or not is something else, but we have taken over the planet literally. But let's see where we go, go from here. What did we do to become dominant? What, can, what gave us this advantage? Two, we did two things. First, we lost our reproductive uh, profuseness. We gave up the ability to have multiple uh, progeny. And that's why we have, we, we had shorter, longer Easter cycles. 
and therefore we had a lower number of kids. Why? Why did that give us a, a, an advantage? Because it gave motherhood and parenthood a longer period of time to take care of children. In fact, till the apes came, in, uh, till, till, you know, there's probably one or two primates that actually have adolescence. And in humans, adolescence goes on till, my mother thinks I'm, a, I'm an adolescent at 53, so for us, adolescence lasts a very long time. I still live with her, right? So, so that, is, uh, that is the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is that our brain became larger and larger and larger. But when, we, when our brains became larger, we, we, we started getting consciousness, we had cognition, we had a whole bunch of other things that, that became very, very important. In fact, it's our brains that conveyed, that gave us our survival advantage. We moved away from being hunters, to become agrarianist, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. But when the brain grew, it came with a condition. And that condition was uh, that it will be very pure in its energy requirements. And its energy requirements was glucose. Right? And then to keep that energy requirement and to make sure that only the brain was, was preserved. It's like, you know, the queen bee being preserved by everything else. The queen bee of a body is the brain. To keep the brain preserved, you had to make sure that there was alternate fuels that were available for all the other parts of the body so that the brain could get glucose whenever it wanted. It's like, it's like having a baby. The baby is an obligatory glucose consumer, right? Everything that the body does makes sure that the baby gets the glucose. And similarly, how the brain works. And every time that there is a challenge that the body makes sure that the glucose is diverted to the brain. That was the doing of the human species. Unfortunately, that was the undoing of the human species. We'll talk about the undoing. For many, many, many years, we ate to live. But I can tell you, we are the only two of the species. We are the only species, in fact. I've heard lions do this. You read about the lions and see about it. We are the only species that eats for pleasure and hunts for pleasure. We are the only species that kills for pleasure, absolutely. No other species does that, right? So, so what happens is that we started eating for pleasure. The habit of eating and drinking for company and pleasure is a very, very Western construct. But that's all true. You must realize that the traditional construct of eating in, at least in the Indian culture, was uchishta. You know what uchishta means? Well, our milk is first fed, is, we don't eat milk that's not at least suckled first by the calf. My great grandfather would not eat till an atiti. An atiti is an uninvited, unintended guest was fed first. Right? So it was not about pleasure. But eating for pleasure happened in the last 50 to 100 years. For those of you who, who've read about the famous temples of India, the famous landmarks of India, you'll never find the famous hotels of India till 100 years ago, right? They did not exist. In every home, in our homes, there was a tinmay. You would leave two pots of water, one to wash your hands and one to drink when you go to bed and any stranger could come and sleep there. And the next day morning, they could have their bath, come back, eat whatever it was, and then go. So, in fact, I, I, know, uh, I know the history of uh, Sri Sachidananda Shivabhinoda Bharati, 
who actually moved away from the main uh, city of Shrungeri into Narasimha one other day, the first hotel opened in Shrungeri. So that was food, but they started eating food. Now let me tell you a very ancient pathway that exists. Because the body was using a substance called fat, when it felt threatened, fat started getting associated with another thing that the body does when it feels threatened, inflammation. The body knows only to react to any threat, any threat, but only one way. It has an army of cells that make substances that go attack. And, it, and, and you saw in during COVID times what happens when that becomes awry, didn't you? You saw these hyperinflammations and COVID deaths. It was not from the, from the virus. It was from the inflammatory response that followed the virus. All right? The body knows how to attack. So if it's an acute infection, you form pus, you have a fever, go away. On the other hand, if it is chronic, so you do gorilla warfare. If it's chronic, if it's somebody raising, uh, having siege, uh, laying waste to your lands, you attack, you, you, you build up a defense and you attack and you build, but at some point of time you also lose. That's chronic inflammation. And I'll tell you, diseases like diabetes and heart disease are diseases of chronic inflammation, not necessarily just the arthritis that you see. And that's, that's what's going to be the rest of my talk. So, so to go back, what would happen in the past was when you had an infection, what did the body say? Let me preserve my brain. It's very important for me. Let me divert the glucose to the brain. Let the rest of the body use fat. And how do you do that? How do you prevent the rest of the cells of your body from draining the glucose out? The fat would make the rest of the cells of the body resistant to the action of insulin. Now insulin is the hormone that is made with the pancreas. And, it is a, and its main function is to make the cell take up glucose. And the cells became resistant to insulin, glucose cannot go up, go into the cell. When glucose does not go into the cell, where does it go? It goes to the brain. The brain pulls it up. The brain does not have insulin resistance, except when you become, have Alzheimer's disease. So the glucose is available to the brain, the body starts using fat. Remember I said, so what did the, what did the human, human body and other bodies also, Develop over a period of time is that whenever there is excess fat in the body, it sends a signal saying, look, something is wrong that's going on. I need you inflammatory cells to come and help us out. So you see the first step in the choreographic dissonance I talked about. What was programmed to be an instant way by which the fuel and the ammunition were going together they started going together when trouble was presented. Because we all started eating more, the, the body in, in so many, so many, so many years, in the last millions of years, we've never been in a state where we had more than we needed. I think even when, when you know, the Cholas were using elephants to thresh the uh, grain, I don't think they ever had the kind of food we had. They didn't have the kind of food available at all the seasons that we had. They never had the kind of food that was stocked in the refrigerator for months. They certainly never had processed food. Right? So, th so there was never plenty. Right? And of course, they had fast system. But, but in the last 100 years, this is exactly what we have. The body is used to conserving energy. I'll tell you a little story about it because this is one of the drugs that many of some of you who are diabetics actually use. The Normally, not a single drop of glucose or sugar goes into the urine. Why? Every piece of glucose is valuable to the body because the body takes it back, it reabsorbs it. And when it gets excess energy, what does it do? It stores it. Where does it store? Fat. That's how we become fat. What it doesn't use, it stores, it puts it up for a rainy day and say, look, I might go through a period of starvation. Let me use it at the time. 
but but we never starve, right? We've increased uh, what was traditionally a two-day meal. Uh, most, I, 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 try, I mean, please, please excuse me if, when I interpolate a lot from our customs. So if you know, if you know the offerings in, in at least South Indian uh, temples, there are only two. There are only two mantras for it, right? Satyam Tattvena Parishinchami is the first one in the morning. Second, Ritam Tattvena Parishinchami, which means morning Satyam Tattvena, evening Ritam Tattvena. There are only two mantras, which means there are only two offerings. That meant, remember, you were supposed to eat only after you gave it to the deity and to an atiti. Therefore, you ate only twice. How many times do you eat now? Every, every hour, every second hour, every half an hour, right? So the body started packing it. And at some point of time, a signal was starting to go to the defense cells saying, you know what? Something is going on wrong because there is too much fat. And, and the fat cells, they start expanding. And at some point of time, they actually die. When one of those dies, what happens? Inflammation happens. The inflammatory signal that comes in, the, the, the cells of the body just rush in to say something's going on, they enter the abdomen. And this is where a jugal bandhi occurs. Between the fat cells that make the hormones called adipokines, you know, leptin, resistant, whole bunch. And then the inflammatory cells, which are the macrophages that come in from the bone marrow all the way to come in to rescue. They come to rescue but they do something that happened in the Haldi Gati. They, they turn traitor, right? The T cells, which are the, the cells, instead of becoming helper cells, become, become destroying cells. And along with the fat, they create, create this degree of inflammation. When the fat reaches the liver, you get this condition where the body cells start becoming resistant to the action of insulin. Not because the brain needs it, but because you have thrown this choreograph into dissonance, you kept eating more and more. Right. And then this inflammation reaches the pancreas. In the pancreas, there are a bunch of cells that are called the beta cells. Remember, they never work alone. There are, there are an alpha cell, there's a delta cell, there's a whole bunch of cells that work together. They work as, 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 as a, in a harmony, in a ballet, in a, in a chorus, right? It, when we talk about one cell, it's not never one cell. It always affects everything else. Remember, I said that there are hormones that connect each of our cells. So this particular cell is very important because it makes insulin. And because it's so important, it consumes a lot of energy. And any time you're, you're a cell that consumes a lot of energy, you're, you're probably the one that's going to be attacked first. And indeed, that's what gets attacked. And when that beta cell becomes attacked, you get inflammation. When that inflammation occurs, there are two things that happen. We used to think that these beta cells die apoptosis. Many of those don't die. They actually go back to a primitive form, activism. They, they, they hibernate and say, look, you know, I understand that you're eating a lot now. Maybe someday you will stop eating so much and I can grow back to being a beta cell. I'm saying this because there's a little hope for all of us that, that when we start doing the right things, when you get the discipline that she was talking about, the, the word is anushtana. You bring, you internalize what you, what you conceived into practice. Maybe the beta cells will go back, right? But, but that, that's getting away from our story. So let's move on with our story. So the first part, of what creates this choreographic dissonance is our love for food. In my own community, we are called Bojana Priya. Actually, there used to be a time it used to be, we used to be called Bahujana Priya, but that's gone away. And we, are, we, we remain the Bojana Priyas. But, but the idea of eating food for pleasure is the first part. Let me reiterate this thing about restaurant and, and, and processed food. There's a lot of data that is emerging that processed food causes inflammation. So the next time you, you're swigging, zomatoing, or restauranting, or taking away, think about it, right? 
There used to be an old story uh, that uh, Kanchi Paramacha used to say, why should you eat your mother's food or your wife's food? In the olden days, uh, food was never cooked before you took a bath. And I know, know my mother walking out from the bathroom with, with her hair in a little towel. And then as she was cooking, there would be, uh, there would be some shloka that she was saying. And, 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 uh, uh, and you know, the Kanchi Paramacharya actually said, one of the reasons your, food, your mother's food is, is divine for you is because it's like mantra akshara, that there is, there is some divinity that's been put into it. Whether you believe that or not, believe that your home food is best for you. Right. So, so the second part of this food story has got to do with who, think, who, who owns, owns this body. You think you own it, right? It's like a home. You think you own it. The rat that lives there also think it owns it. Similarly, a billion, a trillion bacteria think that your body belongs to them. We are a, mem I'm sorry, I don't have the slides, but we are a mammalian superorganism. That, that our faces, that our mouths, that our uh, intestine contain millions of bacteria. That is your, that is your mother's gift to you. You, you obtain it when, when you pass through your, mo your mom's uh, uh, vaginal passage during birth. You take it in and it protects you. Why? Because she inherited it from her mom and she inherited it from her mom. And in C. elegans, it's been shown that these epigenetic inheritance of evil occurs for 14 generations. But certainly, gut microbiota is maternally inherited. These bacteria have lived with you for years and years and years and years, or generations. And what they do is they, they take in the food that you take, they break down things that you, your body's enzymes can't, they provide you with nutrition that you can, and they build up an environment of health for you. Guess what happens when you start interfering with and, and putting that pizza into your mouth? change it. In fact, our, our group was one of the first to study this in, in India in, in, in many ways. Uh, we looked at uh, the microbiota of the gut and diabetes, and we showed that the ratio of the good bacteria to the bad bacteria, I, can, I don't want to go into the names, uh, changed. We actually did something more interesting in that. We looked at the oral flora of, of, of South Indians who were diabetic, and we did something very, very interesting. One of my interests is to take to see how you can actually look at ancient remedies and, and look at molecular constructs and see if they work. So we, so one of the things that we did was, I don't know how many of you are aware of, of what do you do in the morning? Uh, you go to the tree, you ask it for, for, for forgiveness, and then the, the, this thing says, Tanno Devi Vanaspataye, and, and there are six kinds of twigs that you can brush your teeth. Uh, Vagavata in the, in the Ashtanga Hridayam talks that you should chew it up first so that it doesn't hurt enamel. And one of those is the neem stick. The one worry about using a twig is, 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 is it'll hurt enamel, so be careful. So, you need, so there are enamel, uh, there are enamel friendly twigs available, but what we did was we took a bunch of diabetes, looked at the oral flora and looked at their inflammatory levels. We measured a substance that measures inflammation, it's called MCP6, nothing to do with the men in this room. Uh, it is, it's called monocyte hemoattractant protein 6. It's a very, very good uh, marker of inflammation. And what we did was we asked these people to, to use this, two, this neem stick for, for uh, three months. We used a molecular technology called uh, PCR. And then we looked at the bacteria and we also looked at inflammation after three months. And voila. Very, very, very low. So, again, uh, Small, small things, you know, go back to Kalidasa and rephrase them. Don't think that everything new is wonderful. So in 1976, triclosan was a, was a very, very important part of tooth, toothpaste. Today we know it's a carcinogen. And, and the day Colgate comes with Vedika as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a toothpaste, then you know that, that there was something good going on. Again, uh, the smart person looks at everything and says, is this something that has balance, that's something that, I, that, that, there is, that is evidence. Don't take, take up something just because it's old. 
Don't take, don't give up something new just because it's it's new. Find the balance. So just to tell you, this is what we did. So the gut microbiota is a very, very important part of our body. And I said, it's your mother's gift to you. The, the more you play with it, the more you do processed food, the more you do all this, and we know that when the gut microbiota changes, inflammation occurs. Guess what happens when inflammation occurs? Diabetes occurs, right? This is the first play that we did, food. The second play we did was, diet, was, was light. I'll spend a lot of time on light because that's, that's my area of interest. But before that, let me talk about stress. I, won't, I don't want to do too much about stress because I think everyone's talked about stress. But there is sort of data that, show, that is emerging that shows that when stress occurs, insulin resistance occurs, inflammation occurs and things that calm you down. And there are, there, are, there are studies that were looked at Buddhist monks who meditate, showing that, that as their stress level comes, they do better. How do we know that this is important? We know that the hypothalamus, which is probably a seat of our intellect, can get inflamed when you overeat, can get inflamed in, in all of these. And, and people have looked at that negative emotions in patients with diabetes as a consequence of hypothalamic inflammation. For those of you who Google my work, one of this is one of this is an article called "The Endocrinology of Love," and I can I can tell you that uh, that there is there are very very close links between eating and the reward center. Why do we eat? Because it feels it makes us happy when we eat. Uh, I have patients who distinguish that includes my daughter who distinguishes chocolates from sweets. They tell me the chocolates are not sweets, right? I promise you they are. But, uh, but the important thing to remember is that there is an intricate link between the reward center and doing it. So if you keep rewarding you, if you, uh, I tell patients who come to me and say, uh, with, for obesity, I tell them never give food as a reward. Because when food is given as a reward, then it reinforces something. Give a book as a reward, take them out as a reward, give them some time with you as a reward. Then reward, there is a reinforcement, right? After a period of time, you start looking out for places when you do these kind of things. I, I, I've been fasting uh, intermittently for, for many, many years. And I can tell you that, that over a period of time, you actually look forward to that day of fast. How? Because you find a sense of reward in it, right? Uh, she was talking about doing the hard things. When you start finding reward in doing the hard things, and it becomes part of what you do. It becomes internalized. So I, I, I digress a little more. So let's go back. Let's go back to uh, light. And before that, I said stress. The second part I won't talk about today, and we've done work on this, is vitamin D. Vitamin D has everything to do with light. Uh, we've done some work on it. We know that, that that lack of sunlight and being inside an office room can cause disease. But before that, let me talk to you about another important condition that has changed us from who we are. Many, many years ago, India got an advantage. We were probably the first agrarian economy in the world. Not, not Egypt, not any of us, because... We, of all people, made the epigenetic and genetic changes required to that, that reflect an agrarian uh, economy. If you read the, uh, the Ramayana, you will hear the word, you will, you, will, you will see Valmiki describe people as tall, right? And please don't think Valmiki wrote mythology because there are people who looked at the fauna of India and the flora of India and in every geographic location that he has described, either the Dandakarani forest or, or, or Hampi or, or, or very close to Mahindragiri, the, the flora is exactly the same. So, so Valmiki was no fool, right? But if you, re, if you see the description of Ram, Rama, you will say, you will hear Ajahnubhava. What does Ajahnubhava mean? That, that the hands reach out to the knee. I remember this very well because in our, uh, our uh, my physiology teacher 
made the grave mistake, or maybe he did it intentionally because I was an arrogant jerk at that time, to the external examiner that uh, here is our price students fair. And the first question I got was, uh, in which condition does the hand reach out to the knee, right? It was acromegaly, but, but then he also told me this, you know, Rama was an acromegaly, and I said, wow, no. But, but this is interesting. So we were tall, but why did we need to be tall? Because we need the muscles and needed to be muscular. But when we settled down and, and you know, the land east of the, the Sindhu Saraswati belt, uh, how was Bharata defined as a place where the black buck roams? You want to say, where is the place the black buck roams? That's Bharata. So that is how they defined it, and, and that's where we settled down. And as we settled down, we didn't need those muscles anymore. It became shorter. Right? And if you look at all the excavations from the 5,000 years, you see that. We lost some of the ability to handle glucose. So that's why we are the diabetes capital of the world. What, what became, what was our civilization actually caused some problems. And now in the last one and a half years, we have lost that even more. Sitting is the new smoking. When we sit, our fat cells also sit. And, and, and you need that movement, you need that jiggle, you need that change, you need that dance that you do. You see the horses, they sift, right? We don't do that. And what is the reason for that? Self -love. Right? I used to talk to couples about not bringing uh, televisions into their bedroom. Well, they don't anymore because each one's bringing their cell phone. Right? Uh, the cell phone, is probably the best invention we've had. It's also the reason why families are falling apart. It's also the reason why we're having these diseases. The increase in obesity, the increase in, in non-communicable non or chronic diseases can be directly traced to, the, to, the, to two things, car ownership and television watching. If you watch television for two hours a day, in a year, your weight goes up by 4%. But with cell phones, it's even more because it's even more captivating. We don't even know what, is what, what those lines are doing to our eyes and our thoughts. But I can tell you that there are certain cognitive defects that our kids have. They're visuospatial, they're not oral. So we used, to make, we used to be made fun of because we could listen and repeat, right? Try doing that to a child today. And of course, the CBSE doesn't help us by saying, you know, rote memory is bad. Who said rote memory is bad? And which science said rote memory is bad? You do want that rote memory. Because at 50, I can't, I can't, I, I mean, I should be profusely quoting the scriptures here and I can't. Why? Because I lost the ability to learn certain things after a certain age. When you're young, that rote memory and the ability to hear and repeat is something very, very important. And to go back, the cell phone causes sedentarism. When you're sedentary, something very interesting happened. It's happening to a lot of our older people. It's called sarcopenia. The muscle is lost. When the muscle is lost. Again, insulin has nowhere to go do its action. Diabetes is part of it. And diabetes accelerates sarcopenia. Again, go back. So, how many of you remember your grandmother's taking a nap? I don't. It would be frowned upon. Uh, they would lie down, but often would never sleep. Right? It's, the siesta is a new, new generational idea in India. I love it, it's, especially on a Sunday afternoon. But you know, but I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that, that they would never sit. And of course, we've lost the ability to do small tasks. Now the ADA is coming in and start doing small tasks. Do a little hand pounding, do a little bit 
for work in a kitchen shop. So not doing work, not acting, not doing the little da dances in your own home, right, has cost us. I'm going to spend the rest of my talk on what I like the most and what, what, what brings me to the core of my talk, and that is the rhythms. In, I'm again going to go back to that older cell. There were two parts. One is the availability of energy and the ability to do the internal things. And that was entrained by light. You could do, you, you, you would either create energy during light, leaves do that, or you would create energy during the dark. But there was a strict circadian cycle to life. It was a rhythm. Right. Now, why did we why do why do we need sleep? Have you asked why, why do you need sleep? Nobody knew why we needed sleep from a scientific perspective till the year 2013. It took a scholar in, in one of Harvard's institutes, a, a Chinese lady, two years to train a rat to sit still under a microscope so that we could understand how to sleep. It, it takes that long to, to work, and si that's why science is slow. Uh, when, when science is fast, you get, you get the kind of nonsense that the COVID-19 articles have thrown up, right? It is slow. My, my sister, uh, uh, who, who, who deprived me of sleep last night, uh, because uh, a work that she did in the, in, the late in the late 90s, early 2000s, just got an FDA approval, uh, and, and she's an inventor of that. It's, it's taken her 20 years to see light, to go back to light. What happened? How do, how do hotels clean, or how do airports clean when there's no traffic around? That's when the deep cleaning occurs, right? You know how many of you read Air Airport by, or oh, I even forget the name of the author. Uh, but but someone said it, right? Alex said it. So so it ha ha occurs at night, right? You have gotten so many toxic thoughts and functions. Remember, the brain is so full of energy; it keeps on thinking. Even when you want to do meditation, it keeps thinking of something else, right? In fact, uh, just to, just to take that meditation thing forward, you know what? Shank how Shankara defined uh, samadhi or meditation? He said it's a space. It's like music. You think sa, re, ga, ma is music. I think the pause between the sa and the re is the music, right? So, so you keep thinking, you do, you, you're processing, you're, 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 you're wondering, and all of that consumes energy. And then there is a byproduct of that energy. There's toxic products that are accumulated. That's why, you know, after 25 patients in the morning, you really want to scream and close and go to sleep for 10 minutes. Why? After the 20 minutes in the couch, you get rejuvenated. What happens when you sleep? When you sleep, the brain shrinks to a third of its size. And small channels open up, and I had pictures of that in my talk, uh, open up by which the cleaners of the, bar, of the brain, the CSF, can go down and pull out the toxins. And if you don't sleep good enough, long enough, or at the right time, you can get disease. Some of our work that we did uh, was a Philadelphia sleep questionnaire that we looked at diabetics and we showed that, that their sleep quality was very poor and the, the poorer the sleep quality, the worse was your control. But what we do know is that those who don't sleep well enough, long enough, or at the right times, get diabetes and obesity. And guess who is not sleeping well enough, long enough, and the right, right now? The custodians of our future. I've always wanted to find someone to whom, uh, maybe at, I mean, uh, at the Niti Aayog, or even to Prime Minister Modi himself, asking sometimes, has anyone calculated the, econ the health impact of the growth of the Indian economy? From the 90s, when we've had a financial crisis, 
our youth are working at a different time zone. They work at different shifts, right? And when you do that, one, it causes you to eat. Have you seen how many of our engineers sit with a Coke in their hand when they work? But it also causes a huge dissonance, and I'll show you what happens. I'll talk to you about what happens. So, so it causes obesity first. It also disrupts a lot of things. One of the two elegant experiments, one that we did, uh, what we did, the, the worst of this are nurses. Nurses go on a rotating shift. This month they are on day, the next month they are on night, sometimes it's weekly. What we did was we took uh, my colleagues uh, who worked at Balaji Vidya Peet in, 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 in Pondicherry who, who, who worked with us on this. What we did was we took uh, three sets of rats, these are fisher rats. On one, we put them on a daylight cycle. Remember, uh, actually, uh, rats feed at night, dark, dark light cycle. The other, we reversed it, right? Provided them light when it was dark, darkness when it was light. And the third, we put them on, on a nurse's shift. So normally what happens is that, in the, 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 and we gave them at, at demand food. The rats whose, whose cycles were altered started eating more. They started becoming more anxious. Their hormones of stress started growing, ACTH went up, right? But the surprise too was, when we opened up the rats that, that were just, you know, reverse the cycle, we found that, they, that their pancreas had expanded. So the beta cells had expanded to show that, that their beta cells and, and that they were becoming prone for, for diabetes. But when we opened up the rats that were on a nurse's shift, that was when it was really, really difficult for us because there was extensive necrosis of the pancreas. Remember, the rats have a shorter life cycle. We have a longer one. It takes years for us to develop. But if you're somebody on a shift for 15 to 20 years, or you're in a different time zone for 15 to 20 years, that does havoc to you. Remember that while in the West, diabetes is a disease for of the fifth of the fifth or the sixth of the sixth or the seventh decades. In India, it's a young man's disease or a young woman's disease. Most of our young people are getting diabetes and they live with diabetes for 60, 70 years and they get heart disease. So again, is there, an eco is there a consequence for this, for this economic, so chasing the quarter, I tell some of our patients, uh, I tell some of our patients, you know, while you are working very hard, your, your, your boss is playing golf. You're working very hard so that your boss can play golf. It's important to make that balance. That brings us to the last part of the thing. So there is a circadian rhythm that we have disrupted. But are there other rhythms that we respond to? For example, there's a lion ant that makes a hole in the ground. And that hole is larger in, in during the full moon, smaller in the new moon. We sleep, we sleep shorter in the full moon and longer in the new moon, right? Uh, our women time their menstrual cycles to the moon. And women who live in hostels, they pretty much have, have coordinated cycles. And when your cycle, and when, when your lunar cycle is disrupted, infertility is one of them. But that's not the only rhythm. There are cotidian rhythms. Have you seen the cicadas? The cicadas in the US this year, but they work to the Fibonacci sequence, one, three. That brings us to, we, are we also part of a cosmic cycle? I started this talk uh, with that part because my interest was in, the, in, in, in Nataraja, the dance. The Many, many years ago in the Tillaivana, there was a dance and the dance it was a competition, but then it became a dance, a choreograph that, that Patanjali then took forward to Bharata Muni, and, and that's history. But, but the beauty of, of the Nataraja temple in Chidambaram is that you can't be a king of the Cholas unless you're crowned in Chidambaram, right? That's why Sundara starts, because he had those 3,000 to take care of. The Nataraja temple was twice destroyed. I don't know how many of you know this, but it was destroyed twice. What we have is not what Parantaka Chola created, but what 
probably the Nayaka kings and the Maratha kings, I should tell me. But the, the entire Garbhagraha is very different from any other temple. The number of golden uh, uh, bricks that are laid on top of the Panchakshara Padi is represents the number of nadis that we are supposed to have. And the Chidambara Rahasya is, is the Akasha, that there is no Moolavar Murti in Chidambara. There is no Murti. It's the Utsava that comes out inside. It represents the soul. And the dance of Nataraja is something interesting. Why is it we think about the dance of Nataraja? Those of you who, who, have the, who have had the fortune to go out of the light pollution we have and look at the sky, would see in the southwest part of Chidambaram. That's the only place where you could see the Agastya star, the southern polar star, south of, south of the Bindyas. You can't see it north of the Bindyas. You would see that the Orion constellation fills up the sky. It's called the Hunter, right? And remember the Sri Rudram says, uh, this starts off with Shiva the Hunter. It tells you, Namaste astu dhanmane vahubhya mutate namaha. Protect me from your arrows, from your arms. Don't be like that. It, he is the hunter. Why is the Orion constellation important? Because we saw time with Orion constellation. It was the most, most visible of the constellations. And we calculated time. And remember, we can calc our, our time calculations are 10 to the power of minus 12 all the way up to 10 to the power of 16. That's how we calculated time. And in the 8th century, right where the Betel Geese star is, which is Aradhra, there was a supernova that was visible in the Chola Empire. Those of you who read Pony and Selvan will remember, that, remember the, the comet that he talks about, but it's probably a supernova. And that's where, and, and if you look at this carefully, I'm sorry, I don't have the pictures, uh, you will see that you could superimpose the dance of Shiva into that, right? And, and uh, that dance of Shiva is, is a cosmic consciousness. So when, when people talk about, so, so we do dance to a circadian rhythm. We do dance to a lunar rhythm. We do dance to an ultradian rhythm. It's only a stretch of imagination that we do dance to a cosmic rhythm. That we are part of that cosmos. You may think that, that, that we may be deluded to think that we are individuals, but we are part of that cosmic consciousness. And what diabetes and the diseases that I talked about tells you is that you are part of that symphony. And if you keep working at it and, and start moving it back and disrupt that choreograph, you will hasten your own downfall, as many of us have done. But there is hope, and that hope is to rediscover that rhythm. Make a balance between what is necessary and what is not. And once you know, you know what four wheels is a car, six inches is a mattress. You don't get more comfortable when you have 12 inches. Time to introspect, to reflect, to get when, when I, I, I really don't believe in, 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 in you know, psychobabble. I don't tell people, you know, oh, things will be all right. No, I tell you, if you do these things and you hurt yourself a little, it, you, it will be all right. You have to hurt yourself to improve. You have to suffer to, end, to, to reach the tape. You have to develop discipline to get yourself in harmony with nature, to discover those rhythms, to discover the dance that is there, to... And lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll do this for Shobha's sake because the whole thing started with the little demon in the, in, in the how many of you know the name of the demon in the, under the foot of Nataraja? Apasmara. There is a cosmic thing to it. Lost, lost himself, right? But the word Apasmara in Sanskrit also means epilepsy. When I was a medical student, and one of the reasons, there were several reasons why I went into endocrinology. I heard the story of David and Goliath. I'm a romantic by nature, so I heard the story of David and Goliath and acromegaly. 
And I heard this story from one of my teachers, Dr. Arumugam, who was a pathologist. And he said, you know what, uh, the, the, the person under the uh, foot of Nataraja is a, is a cretin, is a hypothyroid patient. It took me 25 years to change that thing because I started reading about apasmara. Epilepsy is very rare in hypothyroidism. Then I, I started reading Anand Kumaraswamy's description of Nataraja, and please do, you know, it's just, just wonderful. And then I read that the, that the Tamil name for Apaspara was Muyalakan. Why Muyalakan? The hair breathes like an epileptic. A frightened hair breathes like an epileptic. Then I said, you know what, this is interesting. And then I realized that he was not a hypothyroid patient, but he had a problem with a receptor that senses calcium. And, and I wrote about it and said that under the icon that is there in Chidambaram. And by the way, the, the, the Shiva in, 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 in Chidambaram is not, is not doing an Ugrathandava. But in the, uh, his hair, and I, I've had the fortune of one being through Aradra, sitting in front and also seeing him from the back, and his hair is just, it's not, it's, it's, it's frozen in a state of, 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 you know, calm. It is not the Ugra Tandava or the Rudra Tandava, the thing. It is, it is, it is, it is the happiness that you want to see in us. It is the Ananda Tandava. So, so there, there in Shiva, who, who, who is the antithesis of everything that Apasmara is. That's where we need to find our inspiration. And the inspiration is there in our society, in our culture, in our, in our, in our ancients, in our, in our little customs, in the food that we serve on a Shraddha day, in, in the fast that we do, in, in the kind of baths that we go and take. Find a ritual, find a discipline, bring it into practice. I tell a lot of diabetics, you're lucky because you have a reason to be disciplined. And that is more easy to live a lifestyle when you're disciplined than when you aren't. So with that, I, I hope I've not exceeded my time. I'm sorry, I had some beautiful pictures to show you, but I hope that this is even better because you could picture it in your mind, in your heart. And after all, that manasika kalpana is probably more important than any picture that I can show. Thank you so much.